And I'll give a brief introduction, then we'll have Q and A. Um, if you read a book written by the first chief herald of Ireland, Edward McLeiser, in his introduction, he says, if you're an O'Kelly, go to the office of chief herald of Ireland and make sure you can use the O'Kelly coat of arms that are registered. Because there are many O'Kelly different clans. There are also many O'Neill different clans. McDonough and so on and so forth. So I think the discussion we'll have with Mike is a little bit around the journey of understanding the difference between a surname, a clan, a clan and its branches, and different clans. So Mike, you, you actually, a few years back, there was a Fitzpatrick Surname Association. And now I think we have four different clan or branches named Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick of Breffney, Fitzpatrick of Dalcas, uh, Fitzpatrick of Leinster, if I'm correct, or Oper Ossery. Can you tell us Leinster and Oper Ossery? Oh, okay, Two. see how complicated it gets. Uh, can you tell us your journey and your thinking and what was really your discovery uh, uh, drive to reach a level of truth, really? Like many um, Fitzpatrick's in the diaspora, like many Irish in the diaspora, um, we didn't know where we were from. My family didn't know where we were from. The father of the family died uh, in the famine. His wife, Margaret, uh, took his twin sons, John, the giant, Fitzpatrick, and his brother, Robert, and Mary and Margaret, they took them to Liverpool. And it was tough times. Uh, poverty, death, uh, we survived, but not with the knowledge of where we were from. And it was really only um, with the introduction of Y-DNA testing that we got a clue. And uh, I hooked into some links in County Down. So I'm a County Down Fitzpatrick. It's complex. We'll come to that in a little while when we explain the Leinster Fitzpatrick. So we spread all the way from down, all the way down to Wicklow. So right along the East Coast. So it's a very personal journey. Um, and... As you travel forward doing your own genealogical research, you, you meet people and with the same journey. And so often we would get an email, Mike, um, my ancestor was Patrick Fitzpatrick, and he uh, landed in Boston in 1820. Um, can you help me find out where I'm from in Ireland? <laughs> it's really, really hard. So that has been the journey. It's been the journey, my personal journey, and it's been um, the society journal, the Fitzpatrick Clan Society only formed in 2018, but our mission was perhaps a little different to what it had been before. Instead of perhaps a focus on, uh, on no nobility, uh, the barons of Upper Ossery, and we have, we have one of the Upper Ossery um, people here today, Marion, from the States. Um, we're not at war, <laughs> but the, the <laughs> previous society was really focused on that noble line, and almost, I think, to the exclusion of other clans. When you have a dominant narrative that's so strong and so rich in history, it gives little space to research other lines. And when you read um, the great William Carrigan's works, it, 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 his, his whole attention is on one branch of the family to the great detriment of others. And so that's, that's really where it started, Michael. Okay. And then how did you define or what was the methodology you, you, you used to actually identify the different branches or different clans bearing the name. I mean, you went into some deep dive papers. The, when we spoke together, the fiance, for everyone, the fiance are Elizabethan time uh, pardons that were issues to individuals that either were in rebellion or thought to be in rebellion or didn't want to be in re rebellion, but they wanted to secure really their, their wealth. Mm. And, and not be attained. And uh, so it is a, really a collection of almost every able-bodied man in the country, in those counties or areas. The fence are remarkable. And if, as a researcher, you've not dived into the fence, um, do it. <laughs> um, the narrative can be told in many different ways, and I'll, I'll spin it my way today. And I'll start by talking about the Dalcassian Fitzpatrick's because we, we have kin, Luke, Gerard, Michael, Dalcassian, 
and we define them um, these days, one way of defining them is by their Y DNA haplotype, a newer haplotype L226. Now, you can get a little bit phased by that terminology, but it's just scientific jargon. Uh, I'm a scientist. The L just is, stands for the, re the researchers, the group of researchers that discovered this particular individual mutation, and it was the 226th mutation, L226. There's nothing mystical. That's all it means. If you're a Celt, genetically you're defined by the mutation L21. Again, it was the same group of research. It was their 21st mutation. So we're particularly pleased with the work we've done with the Dalcassians because they were completely forgotten. And we, we have an article in our journal called uh, Megalophadric Dalcass, the rediscovery of a clan. And it's a great story. Um, and again, it really stems from a group of, of Fitzpatrick's very enthusiastic. There's Karen Fitzpatrick Hall, who is hopefully watching here today. She's, she's in the States there. Um, and also Dr. Dan Fitzpatrick in Florida. And, and they were very enthusiastic. We wanted to find out where they were from. Now, Karen's people were from Mayo. And Dan's were from Roscommon. And they did great traditional work. But then they hit the brick wall at 1800 AD or 1780 AD. And they cannot go back any further. So we're heavy reliant on methodology. We're heavy reliant initially on the Y-DNA, trying to understand the different branches of a particular Y-DNA haplotype. And then we go to whatever research notes we can find. Now, as I said before, we have a dominant narrative and the great authors of Fitzpatrick histories are William Carrigan, the Reverend William Carrigan, and uh, Reverend John Sherman. And I've noticed amongst, and this is not to demean anybody, but I've noticed amongst uh, Irish researchers, it's almost like these men are considered so holy and so great that you can't question. Um, and maybe it's because we're from down under. Uh, we like to question. We like to critically review. Um, and so along the way, we know if you're going to start looking closely at a dominant narrative and disrupting a dominant narrative, you're going to upset some people. Not everybody's going to be happy. It's shocking some of the things you'll turn up. If you don't want to know, don't go looking at DNA. I'm serious. I mean, I speak from my personal experience. Just six months ago, I had a very close autosomal DNA match. And on my side and my mum's side, now my mum is very English from Liverpool, but Lancashire, Somerset, down south, uh, very English. Her mother was very well-to-do. Uh, her father was in the army. Um, long story short, six months ago, I rang up my mother. Mum, your dad's not your dad. <laughs> that was my reaction. That was my sister's reaction. But mum, 86-year-old, was shocked. And it's shocking on an individual level when you find these skeletons in the closet. My, my brother-in-law, he's like Peter Kay, the, the, the Lancashire comedian. Don't go looking for skeletons in the closet, lad. Just leave them there. And um, now if it's shocking on an individual level, what do you think it might do on a clan level? When a clan discovers there's something different than what the traditional narrative has said. Okay, so back to the Dalcassians. These were no people. These were not a clan. When they were first discovered by uh, Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick at around about 2003, she's the, the one that started the Fitzpatrick DNA project. And kudos to her, a great woman, a great researcher. When they were first discovered, though, they were called um, illegitimate Spaniards. <laughs> but no, no, they're a very noble line of Megalophadric. So what did we do? We, we went initially to Luke McInerney, actually, and his work. And he had a fascinating record from starting with uh, Finn Megalophadric of Listunvana in County Clare. They had a castle, uh, had uh, intermarriage with O'Briens and, and all sorts of people. And, but the best bit was that uh, he had a very strong pedigree uh, from the, um, the, the funeral entries back to Scannell Fitzpatrick of Upper Ossery. Now, this is, this is the difficulty because now we have a Dalcassian clan coming out of Upper Ossery, and that challenges the narrative of the people of Leash and Kilkenny, who are a big group. So straight away, we've caused, caused a big disruption. Anyway, what we did... We, we followed genetically and historically the movement of those people from Listunvana and, and into the Burren uh, in that area, Abrican. Um, and after the composition of Connaught, they were, they were dispersed 
and they fled off to uh, Galway and, and Aran Islands. They were intermarried with the merchants of Galway. And so they built up this network that Luke writes about of, of relationships with Norman families, actually. Um, the, the ones on Aran, they were, they were sheep smugglers, wool smugglers, uh, very wealthy. But uh, at, at the time of Cromwell then, they became dispersed. Uh, they lost their lands. And that's why we find them in Mayo and Roscommon, because they went with families like the French family. Uh, in, in, in Ross Common, for example. So we were able to, first of all, create a picture genetically and then go into some records that aren't just textbooks records. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the fence. Yes, they're there in the fence as well. And that enables us to um, put together more detail on the tree. So um, it, was, it was great to, to, to rediscover, rediscover that clan and, and give them a name and give them a life. And hopefully they'll, they'll be here next year. And these are your cousins. I mean, this is the thing that I love. I mean, Vincent's talking about clans of Ireland and with such passion. And what I'm passionate about is kindred. So these people are your cousins from maybe 600 AD. Mm -hmm. They're family. Um, the surname Juncture is 1000 AD, but they're your family. And uh, so that's one of the things we like to do. So they actually move from one place and establish themselves into another place. Some stayed. Some, Some stayed. stayed in Clare. In fact, there's an intriguing, one of the things about the fence, you go in there and it's absolutely daunting. Now, we've written a couple of articles in our, in our journal. You can go online and read them. You go into the fence and it's like a telephone book. It's so mm. daunting. It's name after name after name after name. It's place name after place name. And it's not always easy to fathom what those place names mean because they're transcribed from Gaelic into English or some sort of hybrid. But fascinatingly, there's a, a townland in Eastern Clare called Bally Clenny McElfatrick. Bally Clenny uh, McElfatrick, which the great one here tells me might mean something like the town of the pasture or the paddock, the field of the Megalophadre. So clearly they had a, an ancient presence in Clare. They're still there in Clare. They became very prosperous in, in, the, um, in, in the West due to a relationship with the O'Brien. Mm -hmm. Bad times came, some stayed, some fled, and then other bad times came in the 1600s and they, and they moved. So it's really tracking the, the people movement often in the, in the 16th century, the 17th century, that's difficult, but the records are there in the fence if you care to look. So yeah. that's just one of the clans. <laughs> <laughs> so how many branches or sub-clans do you have to the surname now that are identified for? Is that we, have, we have five registered, actually. Five. There was the McGillifadric of Ulster that you didn't mention before, but we have others that were yet to just... Um, develop relationship with, I mean, a, a really interesting one is we've got a group of Fitzpatrick's in County Cork, um, and we know what their, their DNA like, is like. It's a bit like Connor, Connor Sullivan there. These people are, are Sullivans, actually. They come out of that clan. We can, we can see that they came out about 1300. Um, and their surname is Fitz, Fitzpatrick, but what we began to realize is um, probably from about 1400, 1500 through the fence, we see that their surname was Mulpatrick. O. Mulpatrick, uh, a very unusual name, pretty much extinct, although Prontius tells me he knows a fellow who runs a pub up his way, he's a Mulpatrick. Um, and ag again, fascinatingly, it's not just enough for us to identify a group of people there in the fence, but there's a place name called mm. Bali Mulpatrick near Immokili. Now, we don't know where that is. Uh, it's lost to, to me. I've been trying to figure it out. Maybe somebody here who lives down that way can help me out. But uh, these, these people aren't registered yet. Now, th here's one of the, the difficulties we have. Um, you go to someone from down that way and we say, you know, you're actually probably a mole Patrick. And it's a huge shock. I don't want to be a mole Patrick. <laughs> I want to be a Vanilla <laughs> Patrick or a Fitzpatrick or a Patrick, but I don't want to be a mole Patrick. So it's, it's not so simple as identifying these people or identifying a place. You actually got to have buy-in and harmony. And, and there's a, sometimes there's a lot of history. Your own personal identities are locked in so much to who you are. Like my mother was locked into being the daughter of Walter Stevens, uh, who, who was in the army and he was a barman. And instead her father is Alberto Dawson, the chief of police for Liverpool. Oh. Oh, 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 so no conjecture here. <laughs> and the other thing is, my mother, very English, Church of England, her family hated the Irish, hated the Catholics, 
not allowed to wear green. Guess what Alberto Dawson was? An Irish Catholic. <laughs> this is what DNA does. This is what DNA and, can and do. Maybe I'm really giving you the worries, but this is what it can do. Yes. And this is why the French, it's, it's illegal to take a DNA test if you're French. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I wonder why. But I, I suppose in every DNA project, you have that kind of uh, discovery. If you start a DNA project, you need to be ready for surprise. And I shared the story in our clan. We had this, this man, I'm not going to say his name, of course, who pushed to have a DNA project. And he said, and this is a true story, he said, no, no, there won't be any surprise. I know where I'm coming from. <laughs> now, we have 130 in the DNA projects. He's the only one that doesn't have an Irish DNA. <laughs> and obviously he doesn't want to speak about it. So, and that's, that was a shock to him, as you're saying. That was terrible, psychologically, you know. A big so, shock, a big shock. And the barons of Upper Austria, or the Fitz Fitzpatrick of Upper Austria have a really complex narrative. Every Fitzpatrick, when they first start their research, want to descend from the barons. They want the coat of arms. They want the kilt. <laughs> they want it all. Um, and I'm not I'm diminishing anybody, but there is a, a prevalence of thought like that in, in North America. Professor Catherine Nash out of Queen Mary, London, she writes about um, uh, people in the northern, northern Americas doing genealogy, not to find connections necessarily, but to find a point of difference. So, uh, you know, I'm an O'Kelly, and I'm a better O'Kelly than you. That point of difference, and they get caught up emotionally with it. The 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 Fitzpatrick's of Upper Ross are fascinating. Marion here comes from a Levantine line, uh, probably Jewish. So no ancient Irish history. Now that doesn't bother Marion at all, but it, it indicates complexity in the 1500s and 1600s about some of these relationships. The other line, um, the other genetic line that are still Fitzpatrick of Upper Ossery. In my opinion, at least, again, it's controversial, are probably Norman, maybe out of the house of de Clare or de Burke, but very strong Norman signature. And, and again, it's a challenge for, for a relationship, a healthy relationship with those people when I'm telling them they're Norman and they're like, oh, we're Irish. Um, of course, they're, they're Irish. But uh, these are the things that can come upon you. Indeed. But of course, the former Fitzpatrick. He's Norman. Uh, well, well, you know this herald. Fils de Mac mm. Patrick, yes. You know, it always so. fascinates me. Uh, uh, Brian Fitzpatrick, um, the first baron of Upper Austria, 1537, he surrendered um, to, to Henry VIII. Surrender, regret. He took all of the clan's la land in one big swoop. It's been seen before. And, um, and, and Henry VIII said, no more will your kin be called Magalafadrig. You are now... Fitzpatrick. Now, it always intrigued me that why wasn't he Fitz Gilpatrick? Because if you, tra you know, if you transliterate, mm. uh, anyway, as an, as an aside, some of his clan didn't like that idea. Some of his kin, his close kin, said, yes, we're Fitzpatrick. But uh, many of the other branches of, that, of, of, of his family took, reverted back to a patronym. So if you go through the fence, you don't see them as McGillifadrick, you don't see them as Fitzpatrick, you see them as McFinnan and McDavid. And McEdmund and McShearer, they reverted back to their father's name, and you can follow that through. And in fact, in Linear Antiqua, there's the uh, McFinnan, and uh, they're actually McGillifadric. So that's some of the really cool things you can sort of come across as well. Very yeah. interesting. I'm sure in some of the clans, you share a similar experience. I was speaking yesterday with Chris Nolan. Your Nolans were a Leinster clan, and they got themselves into Galway because they established, they fought with Fitzgerald at the Battle of Nogdo after Clan Rickard. And they stayed, some Nolan states, and became merchants in Galway. So very often, war battles are the vehicle for those people moving a word. Certainly with the, the Leinster clan, my people, um, we seem to have, have been focused in that area of Western Wicklow, uh, Carlo, Southern Kildare, uh, and until maybe the mid 1500s, we've got several branches in County Down that you think would all be closely related, but they're not. They're more closely related to other areas. For example, my people in Kilkeel Parish, just under the mountains of Mourne there, um, 
our, our most our most our closest cousin amongst other Fitzpatrick's who are not of down are from Kildare, um, near a place well near Monaster Evan actually. Um, now they're found in the in the fence. You can go into we're doing well, yeah. and we you can go into the fence and you can find a place called Grange Magalafatri. And so not only do we have a genetic group or historical records, we have a townland to tie ourselves to. I've got cousins in County Down, but they're more distant than those ones in Kildare. They're, they're related to people in Carlow. And then we have another branch in County Louth near Drogheda. Um, so these are the things that we are unraveling, quite complex. Um, I know only really well for, for my people uh, from Kildare, they ended up in County Down, well, actually in Antrim, uh, a, a chap called Nice McGillifartrick was an associate of, of Shane Eva O'Neill at Eden uh, Duff Carrick. And in, in, the, in the list of fiends, the big telephone book list of names, there's Shane Eva O'Neill, another O'Neill, and then Nice McGillifartrick is third on the list. So he was someone of prominence. But before I get carried away thinking he was a lord or something magnificent, you find Nice in the estate records of the Bagnalls. And there he's, he's died, but his son, Owen, has taken the land at Ballygowan, town of the Smith. And there it is, niece McGillifatrick, the Smith. So he wasn't anybody noble. He probably just made good swords for the O'Neill <laughs> and found his way up there, you know, around the time of the Nine Years' War. So it's just that, Michael, I I could, as you know, I could talk forever sure. about it. <laughs> Maybe we can open the floor for questions. You have questions? I like that question. We get asked that a lot. Um, and the answer is no. No, because uh, when McGillifatrick was transcribed effectively by a cleric or some other civil servant, um, it was just the way they wrote it down. It bore no significance to a, a division between the Fitz and the Patrick. Um, so not that I've ever seen. There's some that man maintain, we've always spelt it with a capital P. Well, always since, you know, English was written, but, you know, not before that. Well, I mean, McGillifatrick actually was still found among my people in 18, as late as 1807. So there was a resistance. There's a very good agricultural census in County Down that dates to 1803. And um, there was more than one record kept for each farm. So the, the record, um, the, the, the census record people, whoever they were, they went into the farms and they counted how many pigs you had, how many cows you had. This is because there was a threat of war from France at that, at, at that time. And uh, But more than one uh, recorder went out and some had a pro forma <coughs> sheet and they wrote down the names and others had to write it by hand. And you can see, for example, in Clonduff, uh, a parish in, in County Down, uh, there's a Daniel Fitzpatrick recorded with all his cows and sheep. And in a parallel form, he's called Daniel McGillifadrick. So I think there was still resistance as late as the early 1900s and uh, 19th century to maintain our name. But no evidence of a, of a capital P. On that question specifically, originally Fitz means son of and was still written on the registries in Normandy. So they would say, you know, the first name, son of the name's father and the last name. So the, the, the real spelling or, or uh, orthograph of the name would be if you take Fitzgilbert, it's Fitz, and the name is separated, Gilbert, with a capital. Uh -huh. If it is attached, you no longer need a capital. But all the old Norman names, Fitzalan, Fitzgilbert, Fitzgerald, and so on and so forth, were composed of two names specifically. You know, you know, the other thing we notice uh, with the surname Fitzpatrick, and Breffney is a very complex area for us. I mean, there's more, <coughs> more Fitzpatricks in County Cavan than any other county in Ireland. And that whole band of Breffney from Sligo right across uh, to, the, to the east, we've probably got five or six Fitzpatrick clans. And some of them, for example, took their name because of a, a prominent clan member who wanted to form his, a new surname in this, maybe in the 1500s or the 1400s. So there's a very well-known Maguire, uh, Gilpatrick Maguire, and his ancestors became Mac Gilpatrick's. And if you look at the, the DNA project, um, they're all 
connected. The Fitzpatricks and the Maguires are very closely connected in that haplotype. So I, I think my best guess is that uh, it was they, they took a new patronym and branched off from, a, from the Maguire. So we see a little bit of that as well. Um, yeah. We see that in the O'Donohues. They did some DNA studies, the O'Donohue. They thought there was only one clan. But in fact, there are several bearing the same name. And probably one origin is that uh, the, a branch might have adopted an, an O'Donohue wife name. Right. For so because that was for the status. For the status. Oh, really? Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, we have five registered clans. We're looking maybe at 12. So you can see our mission is to take over the clans of Ireland. <laughs> well, we'll, 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 yeah, we'll fight. <laughs> we'll, we'll embrace you. <laughs> Thank you for that really useful, uh, really interesting exposition on the Megilla Fodrick. Um, have you considered the possibility of some branches being of clerical um, background? Um, Ohm well, uh, Fodrig would indicate the descendant of the tonsured follower of Porrig or of, of St. Patrick. Um, I'm just thinking in relation to that reference you made to a branch in Cork. And what could be instructive is to see, is there a correlation of Omel Podrig, Podrigs, et cetera, on church lands, on ecclesiastical lands, when you're trawling back through the records, particularly um, in the 16th and well, late 16th and, and 17th centuries. This is a big, a big question, a big topic, and we, we don't have time. And you get the naughty stick. <laughs> <laughs> Very few Irish writers, uh, historically at least, want to talk about clerical lineages. William Carrigan, the Reverend, didn't he avoided any account of the clerics? Sherman, the, another cleric, just totally avoided them. Yet there's two big clerical lineages, one in your part of the world and one in Upper Ossery. A clerical lineage, for example, might be an abbot or maybe a bishop who has a son, and the son inherits the benefice. So we have the bishop father and a bishop son, which is not allowed, can't do that in the, the eyes of Rome. So quite often a strategy that Luke talks about, one strategy was to mask the surname. So the first bishop might be a Magalafatric and his son might be a whatever, a, a Solomon. But sometimes it, it, it slips through the cracks and you, you can actually trace the clerical lines. But we're just beginning to scratch the surface, Luke. The, you, you'd imagine that the Mole Patricks might be a clerical line. I've, I've got to say that if you drew a line straight through Ireland uh, around Clon McNoise, 75% of the, um, the occurrences of Mole Patrick, if you follow McFurbish, is, is in the north. So it wasn't such a common name in the south. Magillafatric, very, very common in, in Munster, much more common in Leinster, and quite quite common in Oriel. So you, I think we, we have to sort of try to map out those areas and then try to tease it out. But I don't see any evidence yet of, of the Cork ones being clerics. That's very interesting. I think also when we talk about clerical lineages, it's not just, as you mentioned, bishops and abbots, etc., but it's also these quasi-church functionaries like the Eretnachs, the Corbs and other ones who um, essentially were uh, major tenants on Episcopal lands. Uh -huh. And they also, it's a very well-known point, they also spawn many different lineages. Uh -huh. So it could be that the ones in Cork, for example, are of that sort of ilk, right. so Eretnux or, or Corbs. Right. But again, I think it would be instructive to see if there is a correlation between where they're situated prior to dispossessions in the 17th uh -huh. century and does that correlate to church lands? Brilliant. Or Episcopal mensal lands, mm. you know, Brilliant. broadly construed. If you've not read his book, superb. Brilliant. I think we're up. Just about every clan to do a little bit of the same work. Go into the fiance, identify some process. The name and the place, because it's well located. And sometimes because the fans last for several years, it's over Elizabethan time, right? And even after, you can find genealogical line. You can find entire families living in the same, in the same areas. The name change, but you know, they're the son of, the son of, the son of. It's fairly well documented. And you could think that actually it's probably the first and certainly the best survey or census ever done at that time. 
in, uh, in Europe. So if you have the courage, look at it, they're public. You can have them sent and get copies from the National Library of Ireland. They're very nice. And then you can look at the townlands. You can do the correspondence with the townlands. And then a map starts to appear with names, families, and townlands. And it's, it is a fascinating exercise to do. Um, and of course, you can bridge that after with the 19th century census as much as possible. And you can see the evolution of the population. And it's a striking picture that comes up, as you were saying. That may be quite disturbing sometimes, you know. Like we did that in our own clan, and we found out that actually most of the land of the clan was not in the original place, but by the 16th century was south, a detached area that has been conquered and settled. So the local people in the original area are pretty upset when you say that. Just have to tell them they have cousins, that's all. Uh, finally, to close, uh, again, thank you for our friends from New Zealand. I have a closing remark because, you know, I come from France. And New Zealand, Australia, America, Canada is the new world, right? So we like to think that the Irish, when they're poor and starving, and came back to free Europe. So thank you very much. <laughs>